将在钢铁长城面前碰得头破血流。To the country's great rejuvenation, this is a mandate that has been really in all Chinese leaders, you might say, DNA. But they have a real impact on contemporary times and behavior of the five leaders we are going to examine. Mao was also one of the great despots and tyrants of the 20th century. It must be said. So Deng's 10 years in power, uh, transformative in many ways. The June 4th massacre, it has to be said, is a lasting stain on his legacy. Today, Chinese companies were quite familiar, are all over the world. But it was Jiang Zemin who kick-started that process, as I say, around 1997-98. He's often thought to not in fact, have had much effect on the country. Well, I think this description may, in fact, be unfair. He rules China during modern times in ways, however, that are reminiscent of some of China's historical emperors. I am David Shambaugh. Your own again, Chungugun, Oton Naranga. Be Jiang Zai, Shang Tie, Chang Tung Mian Tian. 碰得头破血流。그들이강해질수록두려움은커져갑니다。그런데싫어하는마음은무엇일까요？위대한수업이번엔중국입니다。1년에걸쳐세계최고의중국전문가들을만났습니다인사이트차이나그첫번째강사입니다 My Chinese name is Shen Da Wei. I myself was one of the first groups of American uh, students to go to China. They have a real impact on contemporary times and the behavior of the five leaders we are going to examine uh, in this series in subsequent uh, lectures. Okay, marker. In the world, there are many thoughts in the world. 어떤생각은우리를저먼곳으로데려갑니다Welcome. To We Day Han Suop, Great Minds. I am David Shambaugh, and I'm Professor of Asian Studies, Political Science, and International Affairs, and Director of the China Policy Program at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. In the next five lectures, I will draw on my recent uh, 2021 book, China's Leaders from Mao to Now to provide viewers with individual summaries of the five main leaders of the People's Republic of China since its establishment in 1949. However, in order to provide viewers with background and context to understand each individual leader in this first lecture, 
I wish to highlight several uh, political cultural elements that characterize the Chinese system, which all Chinese leaders must operate in. First, Chinese leaders are, of course, communist. That is to say, Marxist-Leninist in their ideological orientation. But they're also Chinese leaders and are thus deeply shaped by the historical and cultural traditions of politics and rule in Chinese history. Let me provide you with a brief list of a number of the most salient elements and built-in assumptions from Chinese historical uh, tradition that have continued to influence um, leaders since 1949 in the People's Republic of China. First, there is a philosophical belief going back 3,000 years that leaders should inherently be benevolent, what the Chinese call Wang Dao, and they should look out for the best interests of the people. Rulers should set a moral example, Dao De in Chinese, through their own behavior. Legitimacy in the Chinese system is based on benevolent and benign morality. While benevolence is preferred, coercion against usurpers is justified uh, to maintain stability and the sanctity of the regime. However, excessive coercion is considered to be uh, hegemonic, what the Chinese call Ba Dao, and thus is illegitimate. Another consideration for all Chinese leaders is the physical core of China is ethnically Han. Other ethnic groups on the periphery of China, all the way from Northeast China and uh, those of Korean heritage, Manchu heritage, over to the North Mongolian heritage, Uyghur and Kazakh heritage in the Northwest, Tibetan heritage, and others in the Southern periphery. These are all considered to be outsiders. Central China are, are Han Chinese. Other powers are also thought to be predatory. Foreigners are thought to have ulterior motives to take advantage of China, and thus are not to be trusted. China is a great global power with over 3,000 years of history and a highly accomplished civilization and is deserving of respect, and all others uh, should respect China on this basis. However, um, China, beginning in the 18th century, uh, declined. So today, and since the communists came to power in 1949, restoring China to global status as a respected great power, great power is considered to be the primary mission of all Chinese leaders. China is a leading power in Asia and is thought to be um, that way by the, by the Chinese. They believe that they should be treated deferentially by all their neighbors. Historically, this was called the tribute system, and there was no country on China's periphery more deeply entwined in the tribute system than Korea. Uh, but beginning, in, as I say, in the late 18th century through until 1949, China experienced external aggression and plundering by foreign. Mainly European, but also Jap powers, but also Japan, um, which led to the uh, Chinese belief that they had been through a so-called century of shame and humiliation, what they call Bainian Guochi. And as a result, China must never again be subjected to such physical dismemberment, exploitation, and spiritual trauma. Japan's aggression during the Sino-Japanese War of 1894-95 and the atrocities during the invasion and occupation of China from 1937 to 45 are thought to be unforgivable. Mm -hmm. 
A strong national identity and patriotic nationalism, therefore, must be inculcated in all Chinese. To the greatest extent possible, China must remain, it is believed, uh, as autonomous and self-reliant as possible vis-a-vis -vis other nations. Do not become dependent on others. Avoid open confrontation with others, but use deception to neutralize and overcome adversaries. Chinese leaders believe that a strong state is the best defense against both internal and external enemies. They also believe that internal disorder, what they call Luan, is an ever-present possibility and therefore to be avoided at all costs. Consequently, a premium is placed on maintaining stability, what they call Wending, and order, Zhu. Regional and local centrifugal forces are also thought to be strong in China and to pull against uh, the power of the central government. The Chinese have a saying, Tian Gao Huang Di Yuan, the sky is high and the emperor is far away, which illustrates how uh, the further away from the capital you are, the less in control uh, the capital is of local behavior. Elite politics also is believed to be a kind of zero-sum game of what the Chinese call tigers eating tigers. They never trust each other, and they are likely, uh, as others, are likely to seek to subvert the power of the preeminent leader. China is also believed uh, to be constantly under threat from internal and external enemies. Chinese leaders also believe that the maintenance of what is called face in Asian societies, and China it's called Mianzi, is very important um, to, to avoid embarrassment. And this is thought to be essential, not only in dealing uh, inside of China, but also in dealings with foreigners. And elaborate lengths are gone to in order to avoid embarrassment and to maintain the appearances of Chinese leaders as confident and the grandeur of the country. Chinese leaders also believe that the people of the country, all 1.4 billion of them, are kind of loose of sheets, uh, a loose sheet of sand, um, who need to be led through the, by the tutelage of enlightened elites. This goes back to the father of modern China, Sun Yat-sen. Um, he believed that the people of China are not ready for democracy. They are uneducated, illiterate, um, and they need to be led by enlightened elites. Chinese leaders also believe that it's important to maintain flexibility and avoid dependence in foreign relations. And they believe that maintaining secrecy and control domestically is vital at all times. They look to play the long game, and they keep a clear eye on end goals. Time, it is believed, is always an asset. Do not be impatient. When dealing with foreigners in particular, maneuver is a constant feature, as all relationships are eternally fluid. Uh, they must vigilantly, vigilantly safeguard China's territories and claim sovereignty. So, I would uh, start by saying these are many of the operative assumptions I believe many, all Chinese leaders are inculcated with and they all have to operate within. Uh, these are subliminal assumptions, you might say. Um, and they all seem to be inherited from past historical and cultural traditions, but they have a real impact on contemporary times and the behavior of the five leaders we are going to examine uh, in this series in subsequent uh, lectures. In 1949, the Chinese Communist Party seized power from the Nationalist Party, the Kuomintang, and the People's Republic of China was established. From 1949 to the present, 72 years have passed. 
And over the next five uh, episodes, we are going to walk through those 72 years, uh, looking and examining at each of the leaders of that period. We're going to begin in the next lecture with Mao Zedong, uh, the leader of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, when the Ch Communists came to power in 1949, he considered to be the uh, father of the state. He may have rebelled against the imperial system, but ironically, he reigned, certainly in the last 20 years of his life, in a rather classic ch imperial Chinese Im imperial emperor-like style. He seemed more like a traditional emperor than a modern statesman. Um, and he led China throughout his lifetime until he died in 1976. After a two-year interregnum in 1978, Deng Xiaoping uh, came to power. Deng Xiaoping was indeed one of Mao's colleagues. Um, and he survived many purges uh, during the Cultural Revolution and other periods. And by the time Mao died in 1976, he still had uh, 10 or more years um, ahead of him as the leader of China. And from 78, really, until 1989, 11 years, that can be considered the Deng Xiaoping era. Deng is really to be remembered primarily for having overturned the deleterious effects of the Maoist era, having launched the country on the reform and opening policies, having stimulated many of the processes that have resulted in China becoming the global power that it is today. Next, we will examine uh, Deng's successor, a man named Jiang Zemin. Jiang Zemin uh, succeeded Deng after the June 4th massacre in Beijing of 1989. And he stayed in power for 13 years, all the way to 2002. His tenure, Jiang Zemin's tenure, is notable for having overcome the international condemnation and isolation that China had following the June 4th massacre, for stabilizing ties with the United States and broadening China's uh, foreign relations, uh, particularly in Asia. And that includes establishing formal diplomatic relations with the Republic of Korea in 1992, following the Olympic uh, Games in Seoul. In the following segment, we will examine uh, the leader named Hu Jintao. Hu Jintao was, was China's president um, and Communist Party General Secretary from 2002 through to 2012, a 10-year uh, period. But at the end of their tenure, after a decade, Many Chinese referred to this as 10 lost years, a lost decade. Personally, I think this description may in fact be unfair. Beginning in 2012, the last uh, lecture will focus on China's current leader, Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping has now been in power also for a decade but uh, is, and is going to remain in power for the indefinite future, having been confirmed uh, for a third term uh, in, uh, at the 20th Party Congress uh, in uh, 2022. It's not just the party line. The party line has become Xi Jinping's line. There is a personification of power under, Deng, uh, under Xi Jinping. There's a sycophancy, a personality cult toward Xi Jinping we have not seen since Chairman Mao. It is the same thing as under Chairman Mao. 
So that is a roadmap, you might say, for what we're going to cover in the next uh, five sessions. And I look forward uh, to talking with all of you about each of the, these individual leaders and their times during the People's Republic of China. Thank you very much. Yorobuneke, 싫어하는 마음은 무엇일까요? 위대한 수업, 이번엔 중국입니다. 1년에 걸쳐 세계 최고의 중국 전문가들을 만났습니다. 인사이트 차이나 첫 번째 강사입니다. My Chinese name is Shen Dawei. I myself was one of the first groups of American uh, students to go to China. They have a real impact on contemporary times and behavior of the five leaders we are going to examine. Uh, in this series in subsequent uh, lectures. Okay, marker. Tons of people who are in the world, we have a lot of people who are in the world. 我是李德宏。我是李德宏。我是李德宏。我是李德宏。我是李德宏。我是李德宏。我是李德宏。我是李德宏。我是李德宏。我是李德宏。我是李德宏。我是李德宏。我是李德宏。我是李德宏。我是
Um, and as a result, he sought to appeal straight to the masses of the Chinese people. He had an innate faith in them and their ability to exercise collective agency and to change uh, deeply rooted cultural practices, um, norms and institutions was really Mao's goal throughout his lifetime. So looking back over Mao's uh, uh, two and a half decades in power, his lasting legacy, I think it must be said to be mixed, and but generally very negative. On the one hand, he's recognized by Chinese as the father of the republic, the father of so-called New China. He's seen as the leader who restored China's unity and dignity. He's seen as a philosopher statesman. He's seen as the founder of the nation. Mao was also one of the great despots and tyrants of the 20th century, it must be said, in the league of Hitler and Stalin in terms of the uh, deaths caused during his rule. Between 40 and 50 million Chinese died as a direct result of his policies and countless millions were persecuted. So these two elements, a leader who cultivated the masses, yet also stigmatized and terrorized several segments of the population. They stand in contrast, yet I believe they capture a main contradiction of Mao's rule. I believe to fully understand uh, the impact that Mao Zedong had on China during his 27 years in power, from 1949 to 76, it would be useful to trace through uh, some of the events that he um, led China through. So what kind of country did Mao and the Chinese Communists inherit when they um, came to power in October 1949? First of all, the country had been battered um, by several decades of war. Um, primarily the Japanese uh, brutal invasion and full occupation of China from 1937 to 45, the only foreign country ever to succeed in occupying China. Uh, that was followed by five years of civil war between the nationalists and the communists. Together, that wrought havoc on the nation's infrastructure, um, on the cities in particular, on industry, which had literally been bombed and destroyed. The country was, on the one hand, exhausted. On the other hand, it was excited. There was genuine excitement with the um, coming to power of the communists. Um, they really did believe that a new day had dawned, that a new China was, in fact, on the offing and he wanted to restore China's self-confidence, self of self sense of self-respect and dignity. And he wanted, above all others, to respect China. So there is no disputing the fact that, once, um, that a once powerful China had lost its way, uh, beginning really with the Qing Dynasty uh, during uh, the subsequent hundred years, what the Chinese refer to as the century of shame and humiliation, the Bainian Guochi. This is what Mao and the communists sought to reverse. But for Mao and the communists, um, they had some very immediate tasks at hand. Number one, the nationalists that they had just defeated, led by Chiang Kai-shek, uh, had retreated across the Taiwan Strait to Taiwan, where they set up their regime. The Republic of China continued on Taiwan. And from the communist perspective, the last chapter, you might say, in the unification of China and the ending of the Civil War was to, quote, liberate Taiwan, to seize Taiwan. So that was one immediate uh, um, goal of the communists. Secondly, um, they wanted international recognition um, from other countries for their new regime, but they did not get it. 
I think in the first uh, year of their existence, they were only recognized by about 12 countries in the world. You know, from the beginning, China was isolated in the world. It was not in the United Nations. That seat was continued to be held by the Chiang Kai-shek regime on Taiwan. Um, so that was a challenge. So within the first five months of Mao's rule, what did he do? He left China for the first time in his life. He traveled by train all the way across Siberia in February, the dead of winter, to Moscow. Stalin, the Soviet leader at the time, did not treat Mao well at all. Uh, in fact, Stalin only so saw him in the f on the second night in Moscow. They had a formal banquet, and then he didn't see him again for another five weeks. But after six weeks, they were able to conclude a mutual security treaty and alliance, a very large economic assistance program and technology transfer program and political support from the Soviet Union to China. So it has to be recognized that from the very beginning, the Soviet Union was China's only benefactor. So the first decade of Mao's rule, he fully embraced the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union embraced him. However, in 1953, Stalin died. Stalin was replaced by Khrushchev. Khrushchev and Mao never got along. And the relationship began to progressively unravel. Really, from the mid-50s all the way through to 1960, when it finally ruptured altogether. This is known as the Sino-Soviet split. And from then until 19, the mid-1980s, the two countries become major military adversaries with each other. Um, so China's national security environment has to be said through the entire Maoist era was a very endangered one, especially after the Sino-Soviet split. They had no ally, they had no supporters. They had hostile Soviet Union to the north. They had countries like India and Vietnam to the south with whom they fought border wars. So they're very insecure internally in China. Mao then began what I described to you a moment ago about his transformative mission to change Chinese society. He did this through a series of unrelenting campaigns. Yundong is the phrase in Chinese. It started in 1950 and they ran all the way through his lifetime. different types of campaigns, like the Great Leap Forward, which resulted in the death of about 40 million people. That was an attempt to industrialize the countryside, the interior of country. Crazy idea. It resulted in widespread famine, and as I say, about 40 million deaths. Great Leap Forward Famine, 1962, in fact. Mao came under criticism from other leaders he said, who said, you're responsible, 40 million of our countrymen have died because of your crazy policies. And he handed over power, day-to-day -day power, to a series of leaders led by Liu Xiaoqi, the president, Deng Xiaoping, another senior leader, Chen Yun, a senior economist, Long story short, within three years, by 1966, they had restabilized the Chinese economy and it was actually growing uh, quite well. But they had used methods, incentive methods, capitalist methods, um, that Mao uh, thought to be, quote, revisionist. So he comes back to power in 1966 and he accuses them of practicing revisionism. And that launches the Cultural Revolution, which is an attack on these individuals and their policies.
goes on for 10 years. One of the most horrific events, not just in Chinese, but also in world history. Hundreds of, of thousands were executed, several million died. But the pre-Cultural Revolution period was also replete with Mao's repeated attacks on institutions, established customs, and multiple groups in the society that he deemed to be, quote, revisionist or counter-revolutionary. Mao had a true transformative mission to thoroughly remold Chinese society. He was not just another emperor in a long line of Chinese dynasties. His rule was diametrically opposed to China's past. The iconoclastic campaign that kicked off uh, and morphed into the Cultural Revolution was known as the Destroy the Four Olds campaign. Destroy old customs, destroy old culture, destroy old habits, destroy old ideas. As Mao saw the 3,000 years of Chinese history as being the problem, and he sought to overcome it in toto. In his belief, China could not move forward and modernize as a society until it destroyed these four olds. Um, so Mao wanted to build a very different kind of society for China, a communist society. He saw socialism uh, as a mere midstep on the transition to pure communism. So Mao, even at the height of the Cultural Revolution, decided that China was in existential danger. The Soviets were about to uh, use nuclear weapons against China. So the first thing Mao did was begin a campaign of what he called building, uh, digging tunnels deep beneath all Chinese cities, bomb shelters, in case of nuclear attack, which is a very real threat. second thing he did was to reach out to the United States as a de facto security guarantor. The Americans were thinking along similar lines. So Nixon and Mao had a meeting of the minds and they met physically in person in February 1972 during the famous week that changed the world. Is no longer a wall dividing China from the rest of the world. In these past four days, we have begun the long process of removing that wall between us. Nixon visited Beijing. That opened a period of Sino-American relations and actually opened a period of relations between China and the West that had not existed. Here we are in 1972, you know, 25 years almost after the communists came to power and they still had no relations with Western Europe, not to mention a number of Latin American countries and others. So Nixon's not only opened the door for relations with the Americans, he opened the door for China to normalize relations with a large number of countries. That was a great strategic bold stroke by Mao, changed uh, China's future. But he was a very old man at that point um, 82 years old, and he was having a number of health problems. He had had several strokes. He had Parkinson's uh, disease. Um, he had some cognitive issues. And finally, he passed away on September 9th, 1976. And the end of the Mao era, um, uh, took place and it produced great outpouring of grief by the nation but also a lot of, of, of curiosity. What comes next? The man who has led us from 1949 to 76 is gone. What do we do? So how do we look back on, the ch on Chairman Mao's uh, legacy?
중국은 어떤 나라인가요? 그들이 강해질수록 두려움은 커져갑니다. 그런데 싫어하는 마음은 무엇일까요? 위대한 수업, 이번엔 중국입니다. 1년에 걸쳐 세계 최고의 중국 전문가들을 만났습니다. 인사이트 차이나 그첫 번째 강사입니다. My Chinese name is Sheng Da Wei. I myself was one of the first groups of American students to go to China. 전 세계에 흩어져 있는 위대한 생각들을 모았습니다. 어떤 생각은 우리를 저먼 곳으로 데려갑니다. 안녕 to We Day Han Suop, Great Minds. I am David Shambaugh, and I'm Professor of Asian Studies, Political Science, and International Affairs, and Director of the China Policy Program at George Washington University in Washington, DC. In this episode, we are going to examine China's second um, major leader, Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping uh, ruled China from 1978, in 1979, um, made a brief comeback in 1992 uh, before dying himself in 1997. Deng had been a, a senior Chinese leader throughout the 1950s um, and early 60s. He was a colleague, close colleague of Mao's. Yet Mao turned on Deng and many others in the Cultural Revolution. Deng Xiaoping was one of the uh, first, if not the most major, uh, casualties, um, political purges of the Cultural Revolution. Deng Xiaoping was living in the uh, Central South region, having worked in a tractor factory near the city of Nanchang. It took Deng two years, actually, to uh, come to power and consolidate his rule. You know, in contrasting Deng and his predecessor Mao Zedong, Deng Xiaoping is often seen as the antithesis of Mao, the anti-Mao. In many ways, he was. Unlike Mao, Deng did not rule through intimidation and coercion, terrorizing the populace through draconian repression the Tiananmen Massacre in 1989 being the obvious exception. Nor did ideology serve much uh, of a t as a tool for Deng's leadership. Um, ideology determined much of what Mao did. To Deng, ideology was an encumbrance. He had a much far better grasp of the intricacies of world affairs and was much more uh, knowledgeable and tolerant uh, of foreign presence in China. Mao was a xenophobe. He didn't want foreigners in China. Mao was suspicious of the West. Deng had certain envy of the West. 
Deng was no less nationalistic than Mao, to be sure. They were both socialized with the same similar views about the need for a strong and dignified China that I spoke about in the first episode. Deng's legacy for China, it must be said, is undoubtedly positive on balance. While I said in the last episode that Mao's legacy was uh, very negative on balance. For Deng, in my view, he rectified many of the, of the wrongs that Mao perpetrated on the country. So what was China like and what kind of country did Deng Xiaoping inherit from Mao Zedong uh, when, after Chairman Mao died in 1976? There was a factional struggle following Mao's death. Um, Uh, that resulted in the arrest of Mao's widow and three others uh, who collectively became known as the Gang of Four. They were put on trial, uh, convicted, imprisoned uh, for the rest of their lives. <laughs> Mao's wife, Zhang Qing, actually committed suicide in prison. So there was a two-year hiatus during which a man named Hua Guofeng uh, ruled China. He was a transitional figure who had been anointed by Mao literally on his deathbed. And he held the country together for two years until Deng Xiaoping could be uh, brought back to power. So uh, in 1978, um, after two years of uh, transition, Hua Guofeng um, began to cede power to Deng Xiaoping. Uh, Deng, what kind of country did Deng inherit? What was China like at this point? What did he have to cope with? Well, in a few words, I would say China was traumatized. Traumatized by the 10 years of the Cultural Revolution and 25 years of Mao's unrelenting political campaigns. It had really sapped the strength, you might say, and the psychological well-being of, of the country. Secondly, China was um, economically very poor, um, very poor country. Agriculture was subsistence at best. Um, industry was very backward. Um, military uh, was um, not modern. So China was uh, not even really a developing country. So Deng, you know, he, had, he faced a number of daunting systemic problems. But fundamentally, everything revolved around the economy. Deng reoriented immediately the entire national mission of the country and of the Communist Party and the Chinese government to economic development. Away from social and political transformation, which it had known under Mao. So from politics to economics. So to his credit, uh, he launched China on that path, a path that is known in China as the reform and opening. Reform and opening. Reform at home, open abroad. But part of opening abroad was to bring foreigners in to China. Foreign investment, foreign business, foreign scholars, foreign students. I myself was one of the first. I went to study in China in 1979. One year after Deng Xiaoping came to power, I was in the first group one of the first groups of American uh, students to go to China. And Deng launched the so-called four modernization policy, agriculture, industry, science and technology, national defense, the four modernizations. As I say, in the countryside, the country was still organized into massive communes, collective agriculture, um, which is not very efficient. So, 
in agriculture, Dung set about, first of all, decollectivizing agriculture. Broke up the commune straight away. Decided to return farming to the household. And once uh, things were grown, such as vegetables and fruits, what were, they, what were the peasants able to do? Mm -hmm. Sell them on private market. So he allowed for private markets in the countryside, bring whatever price they could, could, could bring. So this uh, was fundamentally uh, transformative to the countryside. Um, industry, he inherited backward, underdeveloped industry that had no quality control. It just, it was a Soviet style economy. It produced to the plan, produced to quotas, not to what would be of interest or sale, sell to the population. So these were not, this was not a consumer driven economy. This was a heavy industrial economy. Um, so he had to transition the industrial structure to a more uh, consumer driven economy. Producing things that people didn't have. They didn't have sewing machines. They didn't have refrigerators. They didn't have telephones. They didn't have wristwatches. They didn't have the most basic elements of modern life. How do you get the industrial sector to begin to produce those things and produce better quality goods that people would want to buy? Answer, you incentivize them. You pay them. You pay them what? You pay them bonuses. So Mao, or sorry, Deng introduced a, uh, a piece rate bonus system to the industrial sector. Um, he opened the country to foreign trade and investment. Similarly, there was no investment, foreign investment in China. Um, that was not an accident. Chairman Mao forbid it. He said, we will not take a single penny from foreign countries because that's not socialist, it's not, that's exploitative. Deng said, forget it. If we're gonna modernize, we need all the money we can get. If the World Bank wants to give us money, fine. If the Japanese want to give us money, fine. If the Americans want to give us money, fine. So this economically just kick-started uh, China's uh, growth that has continued more or less to today. Deng emphasized science and technology. He said, if we're going to be a world power, we have to become a, a technological power, a scientific power. Well, how do you do that if you don't have scientists and technicians, which they did not have to speak of in 1978? Answer, you send them abroad for training. So Deng initiated the, for the wave of Chinese students going to the West to Japan, ultimately to South Korea, um, uh, to study. Um, and would allow foreign students, such as myself, to come into China to study, and foreign professors to come into Chinese universities and teach. So this is the reform and opening. And the last area of the four modernizations, national defense. Well, Deng put national defense intentionally last. He said, you have to start with agriculture, you have to go next to industry, Science and technology has to be the basis of all economic development. And unless we modernize science technology in industry, um, we cannot turn to having a modern military. So in those four areas, these are four Deng's, Deng Xiaoping's four priorities. These are the four major problems he inherited. And in 10 years, it's extraordinary what he accomplished. He had a saying, it doesn't matter if the cat is black or white, as long as it catches mice, it's a good cat. Um, so he was much more flexible, much more pragmatic, much less ideological um, than Mao. If it works, do it, was his, uh, <laughs> his uh, motto. He was responsible for establishing diplomatic relations with the United States. He came here to Washington, D.C. in January 1979. I met him uh, three times on that visit. I was present uh, at the White House uh, with President Carter for the normalization of relations between Deng and Carter. He also renormalized ties with the Soviet Union in 1989. He was responsible for opening relations 
uh, with Asian uh, neighbors and European countries. The last priority of Deng, even though it was not part of the four modernizations, was political reform. Deng understood that unless the political structure of China was loosened and liberalized to some degree, it could not facilitate the economic development of the country or the educational development of the country. So uh, Deng knew there, about the uh, relationship between politics and economic growth, and he um, anointed two other leaders named Hu Yaobang and Zhao Ziyang, who were, his, um, who were senior leaders throughout the 1980s before each of them was purged, but they opened the political system. That opening led, amongst other things, to the demonstrations in June, in April, sorry, April, May, and June 1989. demonstration in Beijing. Those demonstrations were catalyzed in mourning to the death of Hu Yaobang, the leader I just mentioned, who was revered by students and, and citizens alike. People poured into Tiananmen Square. The mourning turned into two and a half months of massive demonstrations, so-called pro-democracy demonstrations. Finally, after six weeks of pro-democracy demonstrations, um, uh, the government um, used military force to suppress them. That became the June 4th massacre. So Deng's 10 years in power, uh, transformative in many ways. The June 4th massacre, it has to be said, is a lasting stain on his legacy. Yorobuneke, 싫어하는 마음은 무엇일까요? 위대한 수업 이번엔 중국입니다. 1년에 걸쳐 세계 최고의 중국 전문가들을 만났습니다. 인사이트 차이나 그첫 번째 강사입니다. My Chinese name is Shen Dawei. I myself was one of the first groups of American uh, students to go to China. They have a real impact on contemporary times and the behavior of the five leaders we are going to examine uh, in this series in subsequent uh, lectures. Okay, Marker.
전 세계에 흩어져 있는 위대한 생각들을 모았습니다. 어떤 생각은 우리를 저먼 곳으로 데려갑니다. 我们今天要探讨的是一位伟大的人物，他是中国的第一总统，他是中国的第一总统，他是中国的第一总统，他是中国的第一总统，他是中国的第一总统，他是中国的第一总统，他是中国的第一总统，他是中国的第一总统，他
China uh, as a result of, of, of the use of force uh, against the demonstrators in Beijing that killed approximately 1,500 citizens. Um, that resulted in the uh, um, condemnation and ostracization of China abroad. After hours of shooting and facing a line of troops, the crowd is still here. The shooting stop the killing and down with the government. The West ostracized China, the G7, uh, and individual countries placed a variety of sanctions, economic, political, military sanctions on China. But Jiang Zemin was thrust into power just uh, literally uh, a week or two after the massacre. So the first big challenge he had to face was how to deal with and overcome the um, sanctions um, and the uh, uh, ostracism that China faced vis-a-vis -vis the West. He also faced very immediate problems inside of, of, of Beijing in particular, political problems. Um, how to calm the uh, population? Well, China, uh, Beijing I should say, the city of Beijing, the capital city had been placed under martial law in, on May 20th, 1989. Martial law continued for about a year after the Tiananmen massacre. I know, I lived in Beijing uh, during uh, late 89 and into 1990. The city was on lockdown. It was occupied by the military. So a number of, of considerable number, thousands of Beijing residents and students were arrested, interrogated, beaten, and imprisoned. It was a very draconian uh, atmosphere in terms of sec internal security and political repression. The economy was the third challenge. The economy had actually overheated prior to the Tiananmen massacre. Price, prices were um, rising very quickly. Inflation was rampant. So the government had to bring the inflation down um, which they did through some very strict price controls. And they not only brought inflation down, they brought the economy down. The three years between 89 and 92, there was a real contraction of the Chinese economy. Then in 1992, it was not Jiang Zemin, it was Deng Xiaoping who decided that something had to be done. Deng Xiaoping had formally retired in uh, December, or in the autumn, in the fall of 1989. So he came out of retirement and he took what's known as his southern tour, the Nan Shun in Chinese. And he, uh, over Chinese New Year's holiday, and. February of 1992, he flew down to the very southern province of Guangdong and to the special economic zone of Shenzhen that he himself had created back in 1978. That was a big signal. Go to the special economic zone. It was open to foreigners, sending the signal that China is once again open for business to the outside world. His trip to the South in 1992, the country just came alive economically. Jiang Zemin benefited from it. And we see for the rest of the decade, actually from then until very recently, the Chinese economy just boomed. So Jiang Zemin was the beneficiary of this. I would say the one economic policy that we can attribute to Jiang Zemin is the going out policy, the Zhou Chu Chu policy for China to go global. 
and to try and encourage Chinese companies to go out into the world. So the Dung era was characterized by foreign multinational companies and investors coming into China. Jiang Zemin, beginning in 1998, tried to do the opposite, to encourage Chinese companies to go out and invest in other countries to establish a footprint abroad, which was uh, generally absent at that point in time. Today, Chinese companies were quite familiar are all over the world, but it was Jiang Zemin who kick-started that process, as I say, around 1997, 98. That's really his major, I would argue in my mind, uh, major uh, economic contribution. Politically, um, after the trip to the South by Deng in 1992, um, China uh, and the Communist Party in particular was still traumatized, there's no other word for it, by the collapse of the Soviet Union the previous year. China's nightmare was the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. Um, so the question for the Chinese Communist Party was why did the Soviet Union collapse and the Soviet Communist Party fall from power? And secondly, what can we Chinese learn from the causes of collapse of the Soviet Party so that it doesn't happen to us? I cannot overemphasize for viewers enough um, uh, just how preoccupying that was for the Chinese Communist Party. The collapse of the Soviet Union just seared fear into their minds and their hearts. They thought that that was going to happen to them unless they drew appropriate lessons. And that if uh, the Soviet system had not been so closed and um, through the outside world, wasn't uh, so corrupt, wasn't so dominated by a small group of communist leaders at the top. So the Chinese, in other words, they began to look more deeply at what the Soviet system was. He initiated a variety of, of policies, political reform and opening, um, rebuilding the party apparatus, making the party responsive to society. And he, uh, he restarted a series of stealthy but nonetheless significant political reforms, including one that is attributed to him and is now actually written into the Chinese constitution, a concept called the three represents. We must be the first to 代表中国最广大人民的根本利益，始终做到三个代表，是我们党的列党资本、执政资金、力量资源。Well, to viewers, this may not sound very significant, but the first of those three uh, means was a kind of ideological um, change of significance. It, Jiang Zemin was saying the party should represent the business class, the corporate sector, um, the entrepreneurs of China. This is very un-Marxist, right? Marxist parties are represent who? The workers and the peasants. Deng Xiaoping added intellectuals to that with his 1978 speech. Jiang Zemin adds the business class now. The party should represent the business class as well. So it has to be said on Jiang Zemin's watch that political reform advanced, economic reform boomed, the country boomed. And finally, um, after about a five-year hiatus in which China's relations with the West and the United States uh, were ruptured, they resumed around 1995. And, and Jiang Zemin oversaw that process. Jiang Zemin oversaw the return of Hong Kong to Chinese sovereignty in 1997. He physically went to Hong Kong and oversaw, uh, oversaw that um, momentous occasion. So in retrospect, I would say Jiang Zemin uh, well outperformed 
the original expectations of his rule and he left a legacy of substantive and very positive reforms. Yet it was also, it has to be said, on Zhang's watch that social inequalities deepened significantly, a gap in growth between coastal China and inland China widened, corruption proliferated across the country, low-scale protests kind of mushroomed across the country, between 80, 90, 100,000 per year. Nonetheless, on balance, Zhang's period of rule, I think, was quite successful and turned out to be far more <laughs> than the brief transition many had expected when he was thrust into power in 1989. He kind of grew into the role, you might say, and he gained confidence over time. Uh, indeed, he loved uh, being a paramount leader so much that he resisted stepping down um, because of the mandatory retirement requirements when they came. He'd stepped down from his party uh, position as head of the Communist Party, he stepped down from being president of China, but he retained his chairmanship of the Central Military Commission for two more years after he turned over those other two positions to his successor, Hu Jintao. Um, but even after he stepped down, Jiang Zemin exerted a substantial influence be from behind the scenes throughout the Hu Jintao period. Yorobuneke, 싫어하는 마음은 무엇일까요? 위대한 수업 이번엔 중국입니다. 1년에 걸쳐 세계 최고의 중국 전문가들을 만났습니다. 인사이트 차이나 그첫 번째 강사입니다. My Chinese name is Shen Da Wei. I myself was one of the first groups of American uh, students to go to China. They have a real impact on contemporary times and behavior of the five leaders we are going to examine uh, in this series in subsequent uh, lectures. Okay, marker. John Sege Hutojoin, we de hands and got the room, was in the Otton Sengagen, Uride, one goes to the room, it over. Welcome to We Day Han Suop, Great Minds. I am David Shambaugh, and I'm Professor of Asian Studies, Political Science, and International Affairs, and Director of the China Policy Program at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. In this episode, we will discuss China's fourth uh, major leader since 1949, Hu Jintao. Hu Jintao assumed the top twin positions of party 
General Secretary at the 16th Party Congress in November 2002, and he became President of the People's Republic of China at the National People's Congress in March 2003. Because his predecessor Jiang Zemin did not wish to re relinquish all of his power, Jiang managed to hang on to the position of chairman of the Central Military Commission for another year before handing over to Hu Jintao uh, in 2004. And thus, Hu held the trifecta of all three major leadership uh, positions. How did Hu Jintao become the leader? In fact, it was Deng Xiaoping who had designated Hu to be Jiang Zemin's successor prior to his death. Hu, when he uh, assumed power, was not quite 50 years old, the youngest Chinese leader ever, and thus um, uh, uh, that's notable, you know. So Jiang Zemin had to rule and live his entire 13 years knowing who was coming after him, Hu Jintao. And Jiang Zemin had no say in uh, selecting his own successor. He was pre-selected, as I say, by Deng Xiaoping. On the recommendation of elder Communist Party official, a man named Sung Ping, who had first talent spotted Hu Jintao when they both served in remote Gansu province during the 1970s and early 1980s. In the previous party congress in 1997, he was designated as the official successor. But even before 97, um, Deng Xiaoping has, had uh, identified him as a worthy leader of the so-called fourth generation of leaders. So unlike Jiang Zemin, who was thrust into power with no forewarning, and had no preparation. Hu Jintao had a lot of time for, to prepare for the job. Yeah, but I wouldn't say he used that time during the um, 1990s particularly effectively. What he could have done and should have done, in my view, is to take a page out of Jiang Zemin's playbook and to have cultivated different bureaucratic constituencies in, in outside the party, really. Hu Jintao was a party man through and through. He didn't need to build a party base, but he did need to build a military base. He did need to build um, a, an, you know, an economic base, you might say. He didn't really have any economic program per se. Um, and he didn't have ties to uh, political groups other than what was known as the Youth League faction. This reflects Hu Jintao's time uh, as head of the Youth League. He served as the General Secretary of the Communist Youth League during the mid-1980s. This meant that he served during his Youth League period under the then-liberal Party General Secretary Hu Yaobang, Deng Xiaoping's, one of Deng Xiaoping's right-hand men. Even though they have the same name, Hu Yaobang, Hu Jintao, there was no familial relationship. Um, so this connection uh, between Hu Yaobang and Hu Jintao made many foreign China watchers assume that Hu Jintao was going to be a progressive, even liberal leader as Hu Yaobang had been in the 1980s. It was not to be. Hu Jintao was no liberal in the mold of Hu Yaobang. In my book, I refer to Hu Jintao 
as a technocratic apparatchik. Apparatchik is a Russian term for working in the apparatus. Now, why do I call him a technocrat? Well, because Hu Jintao was trained in engineering um, at Tsinghua University um, and worked subsequently in the hydroelectric industrial sector in Gansu province. Um, so he had technical training. Um, he was an apparatchik because his entire career after building dams <laughs> in Gansu province, uh, his entire career subsequently was in the inner party apparatus. Hu Jintao is what you might call an insider's insider. He was born, bred, trained, and raised through the party system. He's a quintessential party cadre. Um, but he was a very kind of, he was a party man. This is a man, this is a guy who came up through the party apparatus his entire career. Um, didn't travel abroad, didn't know foreign languages. He was a very disciplined apparatchik. He's often thought to not, in fact, have had much effect on the country and to have been a very bland figure. The joke at the time, you know, is that he had no personality, so everybody asked, who's who? Who is this guy? What does he stand for? Does he have a personality? <laughs> in terms of personality, Hu Jintao was almost the opposite of his predecessor, Jiang Zemin. As I said in the uh, last episode, Jiang Zemin was a very gregarious, extroverted, outgoing individual, um, spontaneous person, unscripted individual. Hu Jintao is the opposite of all of those things. He was tightly scripted, very disciplined, evinced no spontaneity. He evinced heart, no personality. He never smiled. He had a, the adjective that was used at the time, certainly by foreigners, to describe Hu Jintao was wooden, wooden, stiff and wooden. Uh, you know, when he moved, it was like he wasn't really moving. Um, when he met with foreigners, he memorized, he had a, a steel trap memory. He never had papers in front of him, but he memorized his talking points, what he was supposed to say, perfectly. There was no need to hand over uh, a script to foreigners after the meeting, as was the case with Jiang Zemin. So, very intelligent individual, um, but no persona. <laughs> you know, by the time he assumed power, um, uh, he had had a career in the provinces, um, not particularly distinguished. He'd worked in three different provinces, in Gansu, in the very far west of the country, a very arid, remote place adjacent to Tibet. Actually, he served in an even uh, more remote place called Guizhou in the southwest of the country, China's poorest province. Then he was transferred to Tibet. Um, so he had years in those three places, um, impoverished places, one has to say, not coastal, well-to-do provinces, interior, underdeveloped, even poor provinces. So by the time he assumes power in 2002, uh, he's had uh, uh, much more exposure to the countryside, uh, the interior of China than Jiang Zemin ever had, um, which is a good thing. And as I um, uh, have indicated, I think it did affect his approach to policies. Well, at the end of, of his 10 years in power, his rule, together with Premier Wen Jiabao, and it has to be uh, considered that uh, China during those 10 years was really run by the two of them, Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao. But at the end of their tenure, after a decade, many Chinese referred to this as 10 lost years, a lost decade. 
Personally, I think this description may in fact be unfair. Some important policy initiatives were launched, and some things were certainly accomplished under their watch, notably in social policy, in party reform, and in foreign policy. But the verdict of few accomplishments and little impact remains the prevalent perception both inside and outside of China of Hu Jintao to this day. Above all, I think Hu Jintao's tenure was in fact marked by several accomplishments. First was a marked uh, shift, a distinct shift in policy emphasis away from the growth at all costs economic calculus and bias towards coastal China that uh, characterized the Jiang Zemin era. Jiang Zemin um, preferred, came from, preferred, and, la and lavished resources upon the coast. Hu Jintao, um, the opposite orientation, the interior of China. And he emphasized um, the in inland Chinese provinces, and he stressed issues such as social equality, social justice, improving basic living standards, and social services, environmental protection, poverty alleviation, reducing the burdens on farmers, public safety, and anti-corruption work, job retraining for people, particularly from the state industrial sector, in, to gain skills to work in other sectors, and other so-called public goods. This is a very commendable and progressive agenda. Even though it was publicly popular and it was well received during Hu Jintao's first term, his first five-year term, the implementation of this agenda floundered, really, it has to be said, during his second term. So he started off well, did not finish well. Now, with the passage of time, perhaps with more retrospect, Hu Jintao's historical reputation may be burnished for the better. I think his tenure, in fact, was noteworthy for its stability, its predictability, and incremental improvements in domestic and foreign policy. By the end of his time in, in office, Hu Jintao could credibly claim um, that he had maintained social and political stability, had overseen considerable economic growth, had paid attention to the less fortunate sectors of society, he had protected national security, and he certainly continued military modernization, and he enhanced China's position and standing in the world, particularly with what's known as the Global South. Hu Jintao reoriented Chinese foreign policy away from the United States and Russia to Asia and the Global South. This is a distinct shift in China's foreign relations. And these accomplishments should, I believe, certainly be considered as successes. Who kept China's development train on the tracks? He kept the party in power, kept the country out of war. He very importantly opened extensive exchanges with Taiwan. We Mainland and Taiwan had no exchanges prior to Hu Jintao's period. Uh, but he worked with the Taiwan's leader, Ma ying -jou, to start them. And he enhanced, as I say, the nation's standing in the world. All important metrics by any standards. Thank you for watching. Feed 
将在钢铁长城面前碰得头破血流。그들이강해질수록두려움은커져갑니다그런데싫어하는마음은무엇일까요위대한수업이번엔중국입니다1년에걸쳐세계최고의중국전문가들을만났습니다인사이트차이나그첫번째강사입니다 My Chinese name is Shen Da Wei. I myself was one of the first groups of American uh, students to go to China. 전세계에흩어져있는위대한생각들을모았습니다어떤생각은우리를저먼곳으로데려갑니다Welcome to We Day Han Suap, Great Minds. I am David Shambaugh, and I'm professor of Asian Studies, Political Science, and International Affairs, and director of the China Policy Program at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. In this episode, we are going to examine China's current leader, uh, the uh, fifth leader since the establishment of the People's Republic of China, Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping has been China's leader since 2012. Xi Jinping, China's uh, current leader for the last decade, is really the most impactful of all the leaders we have looked at in this series, certainly since Mao. In 10 years, he has had an outsized impact on his country and on China's position in the world, really. Now, what a, how did he uh, become the leader of China? In some ways, one might uh, conclude that he, he was born for leadership. Indeed, he's a child of one of the uh, senior Chinese leaders of the 1950s, Xi Zhongshun. Uh, Xi Zhongshun, the father, and his family lived in, physically lived in, the Zhongnanhai leadership compound in the center of Beijing, right, just next to the Forbidden City. He grew up there. He was born in 1953, uh, June, and he uh, lived um, a very sequestered, pampered, elitist life. They call these, uh, these people princelings, or red aristocrats, you know, children of the red elite, the party elite. He had bodyguards, he had cooks, he had servants, he had nannies. Uh, he went to the best primary and secondary schools. In other words, yeah, very different childhood from uh, other, <laughs> other Chinese or any of the other Chinese leaders we have looked at in this, uh, in this series. His father was a uh, close colleague of Mao's before Mao purged him <laughs> in 1964. But then the Cultural Revolution erupted in 1966 and the entire family was splintered. Dad was put in prison. Mom uh, was sent to 
a labor camp, what they call May 7th Cadre School in the southern part of the country. His sister um, wound up committing suicide, we think. He and his brother were separated. Family was broken apart, the nuclear family. Xi Jinping himself was dispatched <laughs> to the northwestern part of the country, Shanxi province, to a very rural, destitute, poor area called Liangjiahe. He spent um, a number of years in Liangjiahe, eight, I believe, altogether. Literally, hoeing, tending sheep, farming, doing ir trying to dig irrigation ditches. Um, it was manual labor, and he didn't see his family. In 1975, mind you, the Cultural Revolution still going on, but it's the tail end of the Cultural Revolution. Xi Jinping is um, selected as the only young person or student from the entire Shanxi province to go to <laughs> university. So he leaves this destitute place in the northwest of the country, enters Tsinghua University in chemical engineering, um, and uh, spends uh, four years there, gets a degree upon graduation, uh, is actually assigned to the military for a year and a half. And he becomes an aide to the Minister of Defense. But after a year and a half serving on the staff of the Minister of Defense, Xi Jinping apparently makes his own decision that he wants to go work in the provinces. If you're going to build a career, a political career in China, you have to uh, you know, uh, tick the boxes of provincial experience. And he begins a 30-year, almost, career in the provinces. Nothing pr particularly distinguished at all about that record. But 2012, um, he is thrust uh, uh, to the top, elected General Secretary of the Communist Party, Chairman of the Central Military Commission, um, President of the People's Republic, um, and he has held those positions ever since 2012. 必须下大气地解决,全党必须警醒起来. Thus, on balance, I would say Xi Jinping's report card after 10 years in power is mixed. No doubt he has had an extraordinary, even outsized impact in a fairly short period of time, which is perhaps even more notable in contrast to his predecessor, Hu Jintao. He has worked very quickly, very methodically, and very thoroughly to implement his agenda. Xi Jinping is obsessed with the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, and he fears uh, that that might happen to the CCP unless certain steps are taken to strengthen it, and he has spent his 10 years in power taking those steps to strengthen the policy, and to strengthen the party. And to his credit, he has involved China more than any previous leader in what's known as global governance. Um, trying to, for China, increase China's contributions to and participation in resolving and addressing global issues, whether it's climate change or peacekeeping operations. So he's become, China has become much more proactive on the world stage under Xi Jinping. Notwithstanding Xi's goals and accomplishments, though, he remains a very divisive figure. 
divisive in China, as many urbanites, intellectuals, ethnic groups, and party members themselves deeply resent the strict controls and draconian repression that he has unleashed on the country. He has seemingly steamrolled any opposition in the leadership, in the party, in the bureaucracies, in the military and the internal security services, and he has decimated dissent in the country at large. He has turned China back into a totalitarian state. In my book, China's Leaders, I describe him as a modern emperor. He rules China during modern times in ways, however, that are reminiscent of some of China's historical emperors, all powerful, regal, fairly aloof, respected, feared, sycophantically revered. In singular control of all organs of state and military power, a believer in China's greatness and a promoter of China's imperial past. Personally, Xi Jinping exudes personal confidence and he exhibits an air of entitlement, almost a sense of destiny. Very unlike Hu Jintao or Jiang Zemin, this is the most powerful leader China has had um, since Mao, or certainly since Deng. What is really noteworthy to me is his overturning of many of Deng's reforms, certainly political reforms. Deng Xiaoping was known for establishing term limits um, for senior leaders. Uh, Xi Jinping has re, um, reworked that, has removed that, rec that um, rule from the Constitution. And so he's able to serve third term as general secretary of the party and president of the country. Um, many of Deng Xiaoping's economic policies, which were of course characterized by embracing the private sector, um, Xi Jinping has overturned that. In the, in the last two, three years, he has initiated a major crackdown on private business in the private sector. Deng Xiaoping, Deng Xiaoping embraced tech, uh, technology, science and technology. What has Xi Jinping done in the last three years? He has cracked down on big tech. wiped out something like four trillion dollars of equity from the uh, tech sector in China. Deng Xiaoping uh, practiced essentially cooperative policies with foreign countries and what he called the um, bide your time, hide your brightness strategy, Taoguang Yanghui in Chinese. In other words, keep a low profile. Deng Xiaoping thought China should keep a low profile, should be cooperative with under other countries, but shouldn't be aggressive, shouldn't be assertive, should not stick its head up too high. Well, Xi Jinping has completely jettisoned that strategy. 10 years of assertiveness, um, some, many people would call it aggression. Certainly towards Taiwan, it has been aggressive. Xi 
是外部势力干涉和极少数台独分裂分子。Uh, relations with many other countries are at their lowest point ever. That is true for U.S.-China relations. That is true for China-Europe relations. That is true uh, for China's relations with many of its neighbors, including South Korea, Australia. As many countries around the world have grown very uncomfortable with China's new assertiveness in foreign affairs, its so-called influence operations abroad, its export of censorship, its coercive economic diplomacy against varying countries, as South Korea itself uh, experienced um, after the radar uh, uh, deployment of American radars in South Korea. China's military modernization has been seen as very threatening in the region, in Asia. The island building campaign and militarization in the South China Sea It's hyper-nationalistic, so-called wolf warrior public diplomacy, these kind of hyper-nationalist spokespersons for the Chinese uh, state, and other steps that have been undertaken under Xi Jinping. They've all caused rising anxieties around the world. So as all Chinese leaders before him, Xi has accepted the principal responsibility to make China strong and respected in the world what he refers to as the country's great rejuvenation. He's also coined the phrase, Ch the Chinese dream, the Zhongguo Meng. This is a mandate that has been really in all Chinese leaders, you might say, DNA, make China strong, recover its greatness. Ever since the country's decline and what they call a century of shame and humiliation, Xi Jinping takes this extremely seriously. He is fixated on power, his own and his country's. Thank you for watching.